What's going on, y'all? My name is Tommy. Well, welcome back to the channel. Dark Archive is upon us, and you know what that means. There's subclasses about this long that we gotta go through. So today, we're breaking out the oscillating wave, building around it, setting things on fire, cooling them off. Matter can neither be created nor destroyed, but we can destroy things with the power of creation. And I'm rambling. If you like what you're seeing, like, subscribe, ding the bell. Stay caught up on all your stuff. Patreon gets you a Google Sheet with this a bunch of other builds, and a bunch of other cool things as well. It's the number one way to help me keep doing what I'm doing, bringing all this sweet, sweet content to you. For now, let's dive in. Hockey dokey. So, as we dive into this, before we get into the meat and potatoes, let us first discuss the conscious mind. It's one half of the subclasses that the Psychic has access to, and us on the Archetype, it's the only one we get. Really for a class that is as complicated as the Psychic is, I feel like for folks newer to tabletop role-playing games, that might be the best place to start, truly. We'll be choosing definitely the most complicated of all of them, the Oscillating Wave. Did I think that the Psychic I was going to be building was going to do energy damage? No, but shout out to everybody who's been abusing Prestidigitation to cook people in bathtubs or like with their own blood forever and ever. This is the validation you have been waiting for. Oscillating Wave focuses on the conservation of energy. Matter can never be created or destroyed, but rather wants to constantly move from one place to another. As such, you begin in a sort of neutral state, and in an encounter, the first time you cast a granted spell from your conscious mind or a side cantrip, in this case for us really, produce flame and ray of frost. Two really good damaging cantrips, see why we're putting this on the magus? We must decide whether we are adding energy or removing it. Once we add energy, we must remove energy the next time one of these spells is cast and at refocus, it resets to neutral. When we add energy, whatever we're casting gains the fire trait, the damage it deals is fire damage, and any resistance it happens to grant is to cold damage. Removing energy does the opposite, cold and fire. We have to choose our Psy cantrips one at a time. First, we'll be choosing Produce Flame. When we use Produce Flame as a melee attack, like we will all the time, because we're Magi, the damage goes from D4s to D6s. When we amp it with a focus point, the damage goes to 1d10 plus 1 point of fire splash or d12s when used as part of a melee attack aka as part of a spell strike that's a d12 cantrip that's barf ray of frost goes up to d10 as well once it gets amped the range gets even farther and you gain temporary hit points equal to half the damage the target takes that lasts for a minute again absolutely bonkers huge on a class with a lower hit point count that wants to be up close and personal, swinging weapons around doing a bunch of damage. It's, ugh, it's terrifying. And that, friends, is exactly why we are building around it. Okay, down to business. Today for the Ancestry, we will be building around the Elemental Heart Dwarf. Their Ancestry boosts to important ability scores that we aren't necessarily tracking are good so we don't, you know, get killed or mind controlled. Plus, I've built around all, like, the strength in things a lot already, so I want to branch out a little farther. The Elemental Heart Dwarf feels very on flavor for this as well. I feel like we choose fire, I feel like most of the time we want to be doing fire damage, and then once per day, for two actions, you can deal 1d6 fire damage to all adjacent creatures on a basic reflex save. This ticks up at three in every two thereafter, for when our spell strike isn't ready and we just want to explode in a gout of flame and then swing at anybody that's still standing, you know what I mean? Because I feel like D12s are the name of this build. We'll be building around the shell of inexorable iron once again, swinging a great axe, gaining temp HP when we're in our stance, starting with a focus point, which is really huge because this build is so focus point hungry. For our background, anything with strength and intelligence buffs will do us just fine. We'd like to begin play with a strength of 16 so we can jam an axe into someone. A dex of 10, the full plate will be doing a lot of the work here. A constitution of 14 so we don't fall over. Matter can never be created nor destroyed and we prefer to not be the latter. An intelligence of 16, we cast off it and we'll have access to some 
really interesting save-based spells from the Psychic, a Wisdom of 14, because we don't want everybody in our heads when we're getting in their heads, and a Charisma of 8, because we're mad, mostly. Casters don't get class feats until second level. The first one we'll be taking will be a Familiar, so we can have something with the Familiar Focus ability on standby as a constant to once per day. Have our familiar use two actions and restore a focus point because again this build's just going to be so damn hungry for him. We want to amp produce flame and ray of frost as much as possible. The psychic dedication happens here. Oh yeah, of course we're playing free archetype. Man, I, the amount of two e tables I've been either invited to or at at this point, as well as the ones I've GM'd, I, I think that's just canon, right? You don't need to follow this card right up here, but do it anyway. Y'all know what it is. It's real good. You should run it. At level four, we'll grab Force Fang to get a complex spell we might use sometimes, but really we just want that third focus point ASAP as possible since, you know, the dedication gives you one. Did I say that? I should have said that. Alongside it, basic psychic spellcasting gives us indeed the basic spellcasting benefits for being a psychic. And then at level six, we'll grab attack of opportunity. I feel like we want to use a mall in this build a lot. I really like the notion of someone who worked like in a coal mine or as a blacksmith or was descended of an Azur much like the heritage might suggest, such that we just really know how to manipulate heat and we're really used to using a hammer. So things go prone when we crit them and then when we stand up, we get to hit them harder, right? Psy development alongside this will grant us another Psy cantrip or the unique surface. This is where we'll grab Ray of Frost. So really before level two and six, our Magi, I guess we're just hanging out with acid splash and or gouging claw until we unlock the back of our head and can start pulling out things from our brain. But this is around the time the build feels like it's hit its first major milestone. You have the ability to back and forth between the two things that can give you a lot of temporary hit points and just straight up do a lot of damage whilst also having an in combat way via our familiar to reset our focus points. Probably the one downside of this build is it's gonna want to stop for 10 minutes to contemplate the orb every combat basically the next major milestone happens immediately after at level eight now that we can qualify out of psychic we will be grabbing both the investigator dedication and investigator's stratagem the secret tech of all magi everywhere really check this out the dedication of course gets you pursue a lead gets you clue in gets you trained in some skills and stuff which can come in really clutch when you're moving around the world and things and everybody likes free extra skills the stratagem however though we can't use our intelligence to modify damage or take like athletic strategist this does let us roll our d20 and use that result should we decide to attack them so we can see when the natural 20 is coming or something that will definitely critically hit against a target so we know exactly when it is the time to use two actions to spell strike with an amped produce flame or a large bucket of d12s thrown directly into someone's face it's it's so rude I think it's why the Investigator will remain my favorite second edition class, like, for all of time. Knowledge is power, kids. Next up, from Absalom City of Lost Omens, Irizoko Tattoo. Because we wouldn't be cool spellcasters without some kind of intricate mark on the side of our face, right? It's practically a class requirement. We'll choose Magus, and then once per day, we can concentrate upon the lines upon our face to recover a focus point as a three-action activity, so when we don't have the time to sit and catch a breather, we can just close our eyes and re-up. Shit's real spicy. On the archetype side, we will grab Cantrip Expansion, unless you think you're going to be fighting a lot of things that are going to do a lot of mental things. I really wanted to take Cyburst, but since we'll never have an unleashed Psyche on the archetype Psychic, really this is about the only thing that can be straight up good everywhere. Two more additional Occult Cantrips on a class that's very cantrip based anyway. Yeah, feels good. Next, we will grab Sustaining Steel for even more temp HP for when we're putting something like Vampiric Touch or Shocking Grasp on the end of our weapon. Man, I wish temp HP stacked. Can you imagine? Whew. Alongside it, Psy Strikes as a free action when our most recent action was to cast a spell once per turn. Let's, whatever we're swinging, deal 1d6 extra force damage until, at least for us, the end of the current turn. It's not a lot, but hey, 
What's an extra 2d6 into someone's head when you critically hit between friends, right? Yeah. At level 14, we will grab Expert Psychic Spellcasting as well as Expansive Spell Strike to begin to pull from the Occult spell list. And at this point in our career, add other things to our repertoire other than do big damage, haha, when the time comes to go to battle. We can now put Saver Sucks on the end of our hammer. It's, it's real tasty. Next up, we'll grab Conflux Focus so we can get two focus points back if we spent at least two. God, we probably did when we refocus. And then alongside this, I'm calling this feat Psychic Breadth. I notice it's not in Dark Archive, and as of this recording, Archives of Nethys doesn't have the psychic archetype up. I have to assume that was a misprint, and this will exist. It does the same thing it does for literally any other caster who can take it, and if I'm wrong and there was just some intentional decision to not give this to the psychic, then oopsie on me. Conflex Wellspring gets you back all three when you refocus. Master Psychic Spellcasting gives us the Master Psychic Benefits, and then lastly at level 20, Supreme Spell Strike gives us a free action on and on forever, ostensibly, to recharge our Spell Strike and Strain Mind. Again, because so many things from the Psychic list right now require an Unleashed Psyche, which we just don't have. Once per hour when we cast a Psy Cantrip with zero focus points, we can pay with our hit points four times the spell's level, as opposed to paying with the focus point because at the end of the game when it's boss fight time we want to be able to supernova, you know what I mean? For the Ancestry feats, we'll grab Unburdened Iron from the gate. It's going to be a little while before we have heavy armor proficiency, but we're never going to have a lot of dexterity, so we gotta have the thing. Next up, we'll grab Vengeful Hatred for the specific type of enemy. Talk to your GM, enemy the plot, basically. The circumstance bonus to them specifically is a, a thing that exists. Mostly we're here to grab the bonus to any creature who happens to crit us, which is probably going to happen, you know, what with that wading into melee sans shield. Energy Blessed comes next to create an emanation of 5, 10, or 15 when we do our big fire explosion and ticks up the damage dice considerably. Mountain Stoutness is our own fancy in-house toughness. Then lastly, Telluric Power. Whilst making a melee strike against a target who is standing on the same earth or stone surface as you are, you get a sizable circumstance bonus to damage. I think this is gonna proc a lot, you know, what with the dungeons made out of stone and ground made of earth. And then lastly for the general feats, armor proficiency, please don't die, toughness, really please don't die, die hard. How many times do I need to say it, y'all? Then incredible initiative and canny acumen for our reflex. Before we burn out today, let's talk about some spells, shall we? First, my two favoritest of all the spells coming out of Dark Archive itself. First, Implement of Destruction. It's a level four divine or occult spell. It targets one enemy and our big fuck off hammer lasts for a minute on a will save. We declare that our hammer real good at hitting you gonna make you be unalived. They make a will save on a crit success, nothing happens. On a success, your weapon deals plus 2d6 mental damage the first time it hits the enemy before the end of the spell's one minute duration. We're spell striking, so a lot of the times we're really just swinging the once, right? On a failure, that damage is persistent and the foe is doomed one for as long as it's got something chewing away at its head. On a critical failure, it's plus 4d6 mental damage to the target enemy. That sucks. That's, ugh, I hate that. I love that, but I hate that. Another spell that I really hate to think about, but also really love, Moth Supper. At a duration of one hour, this is really good to cast after the refocusing. Out you sigh and your breath transforms into delicate black-winged butterflies and huge death's head hawk moths. They flutter about you briefly. Now, huge in Pathfinder has a, a literal meaning. So when I read this, I picture moths the size of elephants, but I, I don't think that's what they were trying to go for here. Off they go looking for blood, corpses, flowering plants, left behind food. With this active, you heal 2d4 hit points every 10 minutes, the first time during the duration when someone successfully treats your wounds, which happens all the time. You get 44 on top of that. You also gain imprecise sense out to 30 feet that can only smell freshly spilled blood and rotten flesh. Clutch against the undead. This scales really well at plus one too. It's ooh. Whew. As far as things we can put on the end of a hammer to debuff other than just knocking them prone a bunch, Synesthesia. For 10 rounds, whatever you hit with the hammer must succeed on a DC5 flat check each time it tries to concentrate or the action fails and is wasted. 
everything becomes concealed from it. Everything gets a flat check from it. That's that's really good. You just passed out a blur to everyone. The creature also becomes clumsy three and gets a minus 10 foot status penalty to all of its speeds. On a success, this is a round. A failure, it's a minute. Critical failure, it's stunned too as well. That's that's a cornucopia of debuffs to AC, to their ability to hit. Everybody hates that, except for you and your friends. Y'all love it. It's great. Alongside this, a rare spell that over the course of days can do a lot of really horrible shit. Internal insurrection. On a success, they're clumsy one for a round, because owie. On a failure, your target is afflicted with internal insurrection at stage one. On a crit fail, it's stage two. Keep this one in your back pocket for when the bad guys like to teleport away, so that way they can, you know, stay in bed till they get better. It's a scaling clumsy penalty, which scales up to flat-footed, then eventually they just die. <sighs> Ah, ooh, bad. For the Magus side, other than the cantrips we're gonna want to flip back and forth through, I feel like a lot of our magic is very straightforward. You could, if you wanted to, just only choose spells like Mirror Image, Stone Skin, I guess you get that one eventually for free, but you know what I mean. Just buff things, relying literally only on the cantrips forever and ever, because they are so good you could. One of my favorites in that vein, Flame Wisp, creates three faintly glowing fiery wisps floating around your head, and every time you bonk someone with your hammer, it does an additional 1d4 fire damage. If you cast a spell with a fire trait while you have fewer than three wisps, a new one appears. We're going to be doing that a lot. This scales at plus 1d4 every two levels, tacking a little bit of incidental damage on top of the big fuck off on fire hammer. But it's a really interesting take on a concept I wasn't expecting to do. I was definitely thinking the first psychic thing I was going to build was going to be something more along the buffy debuffy support line. It's a very good damage based thing that can keep itself standing, which is huge in a game that incentivizes having a healer. If you can provide some of that in-house, not only does that mean your other healers can prioritize others, in some games it might just straight up free up that slot, depending on what y'all have built, how y'all like to do your things, so on and so forth. It does require a lot of downtime to refocus, so if you're in a campaign where the fights start coming and they don't stop coming, well, I mean, pivot to your damaging Magus spells and probably come out alright anyway, right? Anyway, that's all the time I got for this one. What do y'all think? Let me know down in the comments. As always, thank y'all so much for watching. Next week, I think we're going to break out the actual Psychic Psychic. I don't know, I've been watching a buddy of mine stream Nuzlocke runs and then just throwing things from Dark Archive onto a character sheet. So it might be a Thaumaturge, it might be a Chrono Skimmer. There's a lot to unpack here and I'm really enjoying it. I digress, y'all. We'll see you next time.